Good morning, family. It's your brother in Christ, Diamond Dustification from YouTube again. And I want to say right at the offset of this video that I do not hate the rapture. Neither am I coming against or attempting to disparage anybody that preaches on the rapture. I firmly believe that the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is nigh. And I believe that the rapture is something that we should take great hope in. Okay? Today's video is going to be another story that I have written, and this time I actually have written it down, okay, in my eSword program, and I'm going to be reading it out to you, all right? And the point of this story is going to be to illustrate one of the most significant problems I have noticed within the church body today. And yes, that problem applies to me as well, okay? I am guilty myself. And while I do not think that this problem is going to be resolved, I, I hope that I can at least help you to understand why and what's going on individually. And I hope that I can encourage at least some of you to address this problem within yourselves and hopefully by doing that within others as well, since we are all part of the same body. What is the problem? Well, it is the way many people have cho chosen to perceive and elevate the rapture in their lives. They have forgotten that it is a hope, but not the hope. And as a result, they have taken their eyes off of Jesus Christ. Now, since the rapture is all about the return of Jesus Christ, that might seem a bit odd to say, but it is the truth nonetheless, and here's why. This is what we were warned about within the Bible. God told us, first and foremost, that because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we would be hated. The world hated him first. And the darkness rejects the light. We are a fragrance of salvation. Whether a, for good or bad, depending upon where a person is in spiritually. Faith or unbelief. Okay? And because of that, we are, we are hated in this world. And we will endure suffering. We are told to put on the armor of God every day through prayer, supplication, Bible reading, and fellowship. We need that armor of God on because the devil prowls about and seeks to attack us at every moment and opportunity he possibly can. We are told to offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice, okay, because it is our, a good and reasonable service. We are told to expect suffering in this world and tribulation and that God would always make a way of escape. All right. And we are also told in, in extremely in, important verses as far as the context of this conversation goes, one of which is Acts one eleven, which says this, Which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Okay? We are told to redeem the times. We are told to live and breathe the gospel in and out of season. And anybody that is so fixated upon the rapture because they want to escape the pain that they're in has forgotten these things, by and large. I understand wanting to see this sin brought to an end. I understand wanting to, to escape the pain that you are in. I understand wanting to see death brought to an end, to be reunited with your family, your friends, and your pets, and ultimately to see Christ. But are you absolutely sure that your motivations for seeing the rapture are pure? Or are they tainted by the fleshly desire to escape tribulation? I understand that you're, you, you need to understand the difference there. We can rejoice in that escape. But let us not forget the commission while we do that, okay? And I'm going to il illustrate as best as I possibly can through this story, and I'm going to get started on it right now, what happens when we do forget that. So let's get started, okay? There once was a young woman who had given her life to the Lord for just a short 10 years, or at least she considered that to be a short period of time compared to many of the elders in the faith she knew. Just shy of being 38 years old with a husband and single child, she understood the true gospel and knew that not only was her salvation secure, but she herself was also secure in the Father's hands in every single respect. Every day she tried hard to live after God, wanting to be a fragrance of Christ unto all she encountered, whether saved or not, and she didn't try by the flesh, but rather by fixating upon Christ. One of the doctrines she ended up particularly intrigued by was that of the rapture. She was a little bit wary of it at first. 
because she because there was a lot of information there to unpack and much of it she didn't understand no matter how many videos she watched or documents she read. So she did what she was supposed to do as a Christian though and she kept at it. She read the scripture to confirm these, the truth of it. She looked at it from as many angles as she could and most importantly she prayed and spoke to the Lord about it until she finally got her answer. When she, when she understood the rapture she was ecstatic. However, she still had trouble with it because she wasn't a very worldly person. That is to say that she didn't know much about geography or the Middle East or, or Israel or anything like that. They were kind of just like gray blobs to her. She, 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 just, she wasn't a very well-traveled woman. But she was able to spot the obvious stuff. The rest of the time she just needed a little help is all. That's all it meant. She knew in her spirit that Jesus said two very important things. Will I find faith when I return and to redeem the time? That is Luke 18.8, Ephesians 5.16, and of course Acts 1.11, which I read earlier. She kept those three verses in mind. Despite all the evil in the world that kept her lamenting over and over again, she could at least go back on the fact that things were good in her own life, to which she thanked God and counted her blessings every day. That's how it was for a solid five years. She watched her son grow up until into an 18 year old boy and she and her husband worked very hard every day to give him a good life and to try and build a happy home in the Lord as much as they possibly could and while they had many trials and tribulations to that effect they always came out stronger for it and they trusted that God would deliver them through all of it that was until one day it all started to fall apart brick by brick it began when her husband got sick. It was just an innocent cough, they thought to themselves, and they didn't really like the doctor. They didn't want to go to the doctor, so they didn't. And after, but, but after that, the coughing didn't go away like they thought it would. I mean, you know, it was just a cough. Maybe it was allergies. Maybe it was post-nasal drip. Why should they worry about it? But then blood showed up on his hand. They didn't hesitate at that point. No more excuses, no more talk about hating the doctor. Blood, that means doctor. So the moment her husband said that the blood showed up, she rushed to the phone, described the symptoms to the doctor, and they got in right away. It didn't take long for the news to drop. It was cancer. And not only that, it was an inoperable cancer. Hearing that, she just kind of sat there along with her husband and listened to the doctor. She didn't know what to do. Did she blow up? Did she fall down into prayer? Did she cry? No. She just kind of sat there and she told herself, okay, inside. They were being tested. She didn't want to fall apart. She didn't want to fly into a rage or play the atheist. God would get them through it, like always. She had to stay faithful. The doctor kept talking. He said that he had a few months to live at best, but the only thing she could think about while he was saying all this is, what was God doing? And then she thought, what about the rapture? Did they even have enough time left on the earth to begin with that she would have to worry about this? Would she or her son even be around for his passing? The only thing she knew for certain is that they needed to pray. She didn't believe in miracle healings from the scammers on TV, but she certainly knew that a prayer was effective and she needed to get a hold of her church, that was for sure. They would be there for them. Her thoughts continued on like that for a while as the doctor continued to speak, and then he started to bring up all the usual suspects, meaningless remedies and experimental methods that both her and her husband knew would never work. They made sure to keep the son out of the room so that he didn't get the news, but given how old he was, they suspected that he probably would put two and two together before long. Either way, they decided to leave and return home. They didn't really say much to each other as they walked out of the hospital, but one thing they noticed right away is when they did get out, the sky was no longer sunny like it was when they had first arrived. Instead, it, was, it had turned gray. A few bits of raindrops were drizzling down onto the pavement in a pitter-patter as they got into their vehicle and started on their way home. But even as she sat in that car, the optimism she had while she was in the hospital, if you could call it that, started to drain. It was mostly because she started asking herself some particular questions. 
and it all revolved around one thing. She just wasn't certain that she'd been a good Christian lately, not when she really thought about it. Now, she had prayed about all those matters, so that meant it was over there, over with, right? She'd asked for forgiveness, and she knew that the Lord would never forsake her. She didn't ask for forgiveness to try and stay saved. It was just about a matter of fellowship, but still, it seemed like it kept happening. That is, she kept making mistake after mistake, and sometimes it was the same mistake over and over again. She sat there in silence, wondering about that time she had gotten angry, about the people on the street she hadn't helped when she could have, about the harsh words she had said towards atheists and Christians alike, about that time her cousin was in, was in prison and she didn't visit him. And it scared her for a moment because it kind of made her think that kind of describes uh, some of the people that are told to depart from him. I mean, what do I do about that? She thought to herself. But no, no, she believed in Christ. She asked for forgiveness, and she had made up for those things. That is to say that she tried to do better. She can't make, she knew she couldn't make up for it. But she, what she meant by that is that she tried to be a better Christian, and that had to matter on some level. At least that's what she told herself. Whatever conclusion she was about to reach or had reached her son broke it when he spoke up and said it's bad isn't it breaking the silence in the car immediately her gaze met with her husband and he and she saw the same uncertainty on his face as she had on her own they didn't know if, if they should wait or if they should tell him now she was confident that she that he felt the same way eventually after a couple seconds passed she spoke up and said we'll talk about it when you get home okay after your father's had some rest she said it over her shoulder, and she knew in her spirit, even as she spoke the words, that she just wasn't prepared to talk about it herself, let alone try and talk, walk her son through it. To that end, the moment she got home, she brushed off any discussion about it, told them both to go get rest while she got dinner prepared. Neither of them seemed to really want to push the matter, so it's, they, they went upstairs and went to sleep and left her in the quiet of the house. And, that, and at that point, well, after dinner anyway, it was time to make some phone calls. So she got she got started on dinner as quick as she could. Nothing fancy. She whipped up a, a big old bowl of soup, put it into three different different dishes, and stuffed them all into the fridge with a, some saran wrap over top of them. And then she let out a sigh and said, that's done. Now it was time to call the pastor. She needed to let him know exactly what was going on. So she did. She picked up her cell phone, she put it to her ear after dialing the number, and she gave it five rings before she finally got an answer. But it wasn't the pastor. Instead, she got this weird and unfamiliar voice that said, Hello! He spoke in a tone that instantly put her off because she could tell how fake and rehearsed it sounded, as if he'd, as if he'd spent this five hours looking into the mirror saying the same word over and over again until he got it just right. And just right wasn't right at all. Hi, can I speak to the pastor? It's about my husband, she said, a little bit impatient already. She didn't want to waste any time getting to the point. He replied, oh, I'm sorry. He's a bit busy right now, and he told me to answer any calls for the time being. I can make a note of it if you like, though. She could almost hear her fake grin through the, through the cell phone. And obviously he was ignoring the distress in her voice. So she replied again, no, this is important. My husband works for the church very frequently, and he... Suddenly she was cut off. Oh, wait, is this Mary? He got her name right, at least. Yes, she replied, yes. Oh, I knew I recognized your voice. Listen, don't you worry about a thing. The church is doing just fine. We found someone to fill in for your husband today, and he's done a fantastic job. And no worries about the teeth, either. He kind of broke into a sarcastic whisper. Yes, but I just wanted to talk about it. She tried to, she tried to chime in. You sure missed a lot, though. Interrupted again. I can't tell you how close we are. Another prophecy has been fulfilled, sister. Oh, joy in the Lord, the rapture is so near, and let me tell you, I can't wait to get off this earth. Can you? At that point, she couldn't take it anymore. Rubbing the top of her head with uh, four fingers on her, on her left hand, she said, Listen, would you stop for just a second? I'm trying to... Her concentration broke. Do you even care about my situation? My husband has cancer, she finally said it. She knew that she was being a little bit rude, but she figured after saying that, he might get the hint. The man replied, oh, 
going quiet for a moment, only to speak up once more. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, sister. I didn't know. Listen, I'll let the pastor know as soon as he's available, and we'll all call a big old prayer session together that your husband gets better, he said. Wait, what do you mean as soon as he's available? I need to talk to him now. She got a little bit louder. Now, dear, there's no reason to be rude. The pastor has many sick people to attend to, and the Lord is with us all. I'll let him know as soon as I can. Until then, you have a nice day. I need to keep the line clear, okay? And just like that, with an electronic click that made her almost want to toss her phone across the room, the man hung up and left her encircled by a silent house, a dull kitchen light, and the torment of her own thoughts. She stood there, looking at her phone, and couldn't help but to chuckle in disbelief as she saw that the call had been ended. How on earth was this guy the one in charge of handling the pastor's phone, she said to herself. Uh, no matter, she shook her head. She'd just ring up a few friends. She, she needed to talk to somebody before the night was over. She needed to get somebody's advice. She needed prayer. She wanted something. She didn't really know what she needed, honestly, when it all came down to it. She could name off a bunch of things, but truth be told, her, she was so scatterbrained that she just couldn't think straight. So she started to ring up her friends. But one by one, all the ladies that she used to sit in the pew next to started to give her very familiar answers. After a while, she started to call some of the goofballs that her husband used to hang around, the ones that kind of clambered all over him and made their little weird fart jokes and all that. But they all gave the same kind of sympathetic comments, offers of prayer and what have you, but none of them seemed too interested to actually talk to her past a few minutes. She wanted them to stay on the line. She wanted them to tell her that everything was going to be okay, that God was testing them. She wanted them to affirm what she wanted, what she believed in her, in her spirit. She wanted them to tell her that everything was going to be okay. But the longer she stayed on the line the more her chest knotted up inside instead as she began to feel more like a burden than a friend to many of them. The words always seemed to drift the same way. They would say, I'm truly sorry to hear that. But their voice would become distorted like they were leaning away from the phone to sigh or to express a discomfort with continuing. Or worse, maybe they were making a face at somebody as though, as though to express disdain for talking to her. Either way, it was very clear they wanted to hang up, or at the very least, they wanted to change the subject. It happened, it happened to her five times in a row, and that was five times too many. She had had enough. On that last call, she squeezed the phone in her hand, and when she picked up on that same dismissive treatment, she didn't wait or try to give some reply any longer this time. She gave a raspy goodbye instead and hung up herself. But before she did, she took she made sure to announce that she was about to hang up. All right then, she said, in a pain as in as painful of a tone as possible, hoping that the other person would pick up on the pain and say, "Wait." And when that didn't happen, she hoped that the other person might think to call her back or may think to invite her to the over to the house or to come over themselves. She stood there for a solid three minutes in the kitchen all by herself looking at the phone waiting for one of them, any of them, to call back. But they never did. Had she not been obvious enough? It's got to be a test, right? A test from God? She put the phone down and sighed. She was tired of thinking about it, so she started towards the stairs, clicked the kitchen light off as she went. Well, maybe they were right. They were callous about it, but with everything going on, with the rapture being so close, did any of it really matter? It was possible that they would be home with the Lord, her and her son, that is, before her husband passed away in the flesh. Well, her, her son, and her husband. <laughs> she smiled at the thought. Then she got up to the bedroom door, and she heard a series of coughing coming from him, and it kind of dawned on her yet again. She wanted to pray to the Lord, if no one else was going to help, he certainly would, right? The moment she thought to pray, however, she finally realized just how scatterbrained she really was. She was barely e able to even remember the Lord's Prayer, much less ask for anything, as she just stood there in the hall trying to think of what to say over top of the noise of her husband. She finally settled on something simple. She spoke the prayer and then followed up with a hush whisper of a sentence, 
which said, in which she said, Father, despite everything today, I know you're in control and I know everything is going to be all right. Please be with us throughout this ordeal and grant us relief in this tribulation. And she ended it there. Sadly, little did she know as she spoke this prayer that everything was about to get much, much worse. Weeks would go by, and she would find herself all but abandoned by her church. Oh, they reached out all right. They, they kept their word about saying a couple prayers about them. They sent a couple gifts. But then they replaced her. Her husband's role at the church was filled by another, and they moved on, continuing to talk about rapture-related prophecy while they held their usual gatherings. And every time she went, whether it was something small like bingo or a full-blown church field trip, as they liked to call it, nobody seemed to want to be around her. It was like she had become ostracized all of a sudden, and she didn't know why. Were they judging her? Did they think that they deserved what was happening, like, like the friends of Job? I mean, she didn't want to be judging judgmental herself, but it was the only thing she could think of. Why why were they pushing her away? Was she too depressing to be around? Her friends kind of scorned her. It wasn't because she wanted to talk about her husband. She wanted to talk about what she was going through, and they just didn't want to hear it. It was enough to make her remember something, though. It was enough to make her think of the people that she had scorned and laughed at herself. Those weirdos that came into the church covered in tattoos that she had snickered at with their girl with the girlfriends and badmouthed with her husband. Was it some kind of punishment from God? To make matters even worse, her husband was starting to fade away, and so too was her son. Every day he was a, he was there a little less more and more preoccupied, that is the son, with other things and doing nothing but going through the motions. She couldn't Every time she looked at him, she couldn't think of anything else but how was she going to support herself or him if, if something were to happen to her husband, especially with the economy the way it was. Her family called a few times. One of them suggested that her husband's sins had caught up with him. Another talked more about themselves than they did about anything she was going through, talking about their own problems, their own lamentings. They didn't really have any words of comfort for her. And then there were her parents. They tried, to, they tried to help and they tried to be there for her and they made many promises. But she couldn't help but feel just as scared for them as she was for their, her husband when she looked at them. They looked ill. They looked tired. They looked old. And she hated it. It all became too much for, before long. Eventually she had to start taking pills to cope with the pain. She had to start taking pills to cope with her insomnia. She couldn't sleep here next to her husband anymore. That didn't stop her from trying. He coughed all night. He coughed all day. And Lord forgive her, there was a few times she had to tell him to stop. She didn't mean to. And she felt bad about it the moment she said it. And she felt even worse that she didn't apologize right away. But she was just so tired, so angry, so scared. She had to stop going to church as well. She didn't have the energy or even the time to do it anymore. And quite frankly, she didn't have the emotional strength to do it anymore either. They didn't want her there, so she wasn't going to go anymore. But she didn't give up on God. She kept praying. She kept praying and praying and praying. But there was never an answer. There was no dream. There was no event. There was no healing. There was no getting better. She didn't know why. Had she had he forsaken her? Did she not believe? Had she not trusted in Christ? Why wasn't he doing something? Anything. He had to come before it got any worse, right? He had to. He needed to. He better. Mom, a voice suddenly called out amidst all these thoughts. It broke all the noise and brought back the silence. And she found herself sitting in the kitchen once more at the table all by herself. Nothing in front of her but a cup of coffee that she had halfway finished. She turned to look at him and she saw that he had seemingly packed his bags and looked like he was ready to leave. What are you doing? she asked and stood up from her chair. What are you doing? I got that job I told you about, remember? I told you a few weeks ago. He said, 
she heard the words and she almost wanted to scream at him like it like it like like someone might might in a movie job now leave what it all went through her head so quickly but she didn't say anything the only thing she could think to say was a calm and collected your father needs you right now but he replied shaking his head i can't do it anymore i can't keep watching the only thing she could think to say at that point was god will but as she mouthed the words her son suddenly screamed no he won't and the and any hush that had, that had entered the room was long since gone just stop he followed up god doesn't care about us mommy never did because it's just us it always has been and now dad is going to die because you wanted to pray that he'd get better instead of go to the hospital hearkening back to all to the days when the coughing started and poking her just where it hurt how dare you say that she said you know that's not true it is true mom i've been telling you what i believe for years and you never listened so much for all our friends in the church huh i can't watch this anymore i can't i won't she couldn't say another word before he turned and slammed the door ignoring as she called out to him she went over opened the door door up and she doesn't even remember what she said it was a mixture of anger and pleading for him not to go but long but he was in the uber and soon enough he was gone before any of it reached his ears just like that a few more weeks would go by and finally the day come mary found herself by her husband's bedside his breathing had been reduced to nothing but a few gasp at life <sighs> It was as if he had aged 80 years right before her eyes. The life was fading from his eyes, and the only way she knew that he was still there was the fact that his left hand was firmly grasping her right as she held the Bible to her chest with the other and wept. She, she, she didn't want to sound like a child. She didn't want to sound defeated. But she didn't know what else to say, so she said it. I can't do this without you. We were supposed to go together. She didn't get a response from him, but he rubbed his thumb across the top of her hand, as if to tell her goodbye or to tell her that it was going to be okay. It didn't matter what he was saying or trying to say because none of it was true in her mind anymore or her spirit. She didn't know what he was thinking or if he was praying or wanted her to pray, but even while she clenched the Bible to her chest, she just didn't have the heart for, for prayer, not anymore. Instead, it was one last desperate plea for God to work a miracle. That's why she had that Bible. She held it tighter and tighter into her chest until it started to bury into her skin hard enough that it hurt. It was a cry for help. A cry for the rapture. And Lord forgive her, a cry for death. She wanted to go home with her husband. She wanted to be woken up from the nightmare, woken up from the nightmare. But instead, with every tick of the clock rattling like a heartbeat, her husband suddenly let out one last gasp of air before his hand fell limp and released his grasp upon her own. At that moment, the Bible fell to the floor with a thud as she screamed, No! Hysterically. The first thing she did was grab at the cuff of his shirt in the hopes if she, if she were just loud enough or physical enough, he might snap back to life. But her face drew near to his, and she saw a horrible sight. She saw the very moment that his eyes fell dark, and al along with his breath. She saw that moment that that old spark that she had known all her life that wooed her so long ago disappeared, and her husband was no more. For hours she cried, screamed, and ranted, and begged God in a thousand different ways for what felt like hours. But it all ended when she collapsed to the floor in a fetal position, mouthing over and over, Please come take me home, Lord Jesus. Please take me home. I want to go home. Before long, another voice entered into the room, and it was a very sinister one. It called out from the dark corner. She didn't bother to look past a glance, but she knew it was the tormentor. And he said, Not soon enough, huh? 
with a laugh. Well, you've always got me. Meanwhile, just a few dozen miles away, her, her old church continued to sing, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Jesus is on the way. With a new congregation member having taken Mary's seat, it was almost as if she had never been there in that church at all. God bless, brothers and sisters. Amen and amen.